So, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to give this lecture. It's a real privilege to come and, and, uh, and share some ideas um, that are hopefully of some use. Um, so we're going to be thinking about the relevance of entrepreneurship to real church leadership. Uh, I just want to say just a brief bit of background. My current role at, at Ruby Hall, uh, Jerry's already outlined, it involves people say, what, what's that? Con director of context-based training, what, what, what do you do? Um, Ridley Hall is a, is a kind of ship where everyone has to lend a hand, so I do lots of things that the other tutors do, and uh, have, I'm a pastoral tutor, and I teach mission, I do pioneering, but I'm helping Ridley and the Cambridge Theological Federation think about new approaches to pre- and post-ordination training. Um, if you've had anything, if you've had your ear to the ground with national developments in, uh, in terms of training, uh, you'll know that context-based training is a kind of buzz phrase that's around. No one really knows what it means. Um, so, um, but it means something to do with not getting cheaper training, but getting more engaged training, uh, more joined up training, training that's hopefully going to equip people for the realities of a rapidly changing ministerial context. There's a lot of um, research and thinking and prayer and uh, conversation in that area at the moment, which is encouraging and exciting. We hosted last week a day in Cambridge for uh, diocesan uh, people to come in and tell us what they want from training. So the Federation was listening and saying, right, okay, if that's what you need, how can we respond? So uh, encouraging, exciting times and good things to be part of. So that's what I do now. And before that, I was at Cranmer Hall, um, teaching mission, teaching pioneering there. And for the latter part of my time there, I was seconded to the diocese and I was rural dean of Easington Deanery. If you know the northeast at all, you'll know Easington Colliery and Peterlee. I was involved in a mission project there involving nine parishes in that area, uh, looking at trying to help um, think about church renewal in that area. With small congregations uh, of, and, and clergy who are thinly spread, thinking, okay, how do we uh, engage creatively in this context? What does the church in 10 years look like here? Trying to learn lessons uh, and disseminate some of that. So that was an exciting thing to be involved with. And some of my thinking here uh, draws on that experience. Um, and my research was, uh, as Jerry mentioned, this, he publishes this book, The Ministry of on, uh, the Entrepreneur, was into uh, parish priests who act entrepreneurially. And um, that came from a little phrase in the Mission Shaped Church report. Um, right at the end, in the recommendations, uh, one of the recommendations was, uh, we recommend that uh, missional entrepreneurs are found and released and I asked Graham Cray, who chaired that working group that published all, what did you mean when you said missional entrepreneurs? What is that? And he, he couldn't really give me a straight answer. He said, well, you know how committees are. You know, we needed some kind of phrase. And you know, that, that one kind of seemed to fit. Um, so, but that really fascinated me, this idea of entrepreneurship and all the baggage that goes with that word. Uh, but, the, but yet it was used in a church report. And, uh, and, and out of that came what we now uh, recognise as pioneer ministry. Uh, and... So thinking, well, uh, pioneers uh, sort of take that entrepreneurial thing for granted, but what about everyone else um, doing stuff in regular parish jobs? I, I've worked with um, quite a few ministers who I would say are entrepreneurs and act entrepreneurially. So my research was, was into what they do, what makes them tick, uh, what the net effect of that kind of ministry is, uh, and I've produced some recommendations for the wider church in that, saying we need to really rethink uh, our uh, misconceptions about that word, entrepreneur, because it's a real gift to us, actually. And people who have that set of character traits are a gift to the church. And in fact, that in a, in a nutshell is what I'm going to talk about. So <laughs> it, it, you could end now and, uh, and go and do something else. <laughs> but the entrepreneurship is a gift of God to the church at this moment in time. Entrepreneurs have always been present in the church and in the people of God, and you can see evidence of that in the Bible and in Christian history. Uh, uh, men and women doing a whole range of things, but I think it's particularly important at this point in time where we face uh, a number of particular challenges and with rapidly changing uh, cultural circumstances and thinking about the church in new ways, entrepreneurs are people who are comfortable with um, moving scenery and who are comfortable with change and can help us navigate change. Um, and can spot opportunities and, and bring others together um, to move forward in a positive and creative direction under the Spirit's guidance. So that's, I want to make a case for, not just for saying entrepreneurs are a good thing, but, but also for saying 
in the church, therefore, it's really important that we create a culture where entrepreneurs are welcome and can do their thing uh, and can emerge. And, and, and that's a big group effort because it's a culture change in, in our mainstream denominations. Um, I've chosen this image. This recurs a few times. It's not massively clear, but you can see it's some wood. And some children, they're my children. And, um, and it's a playful image, and that's deliberate, that they're exploring, and um, there's a freedom, and there's a, um, a desire to uh, yeah, explore and be free and see possibilities. And I think that, for me, goes to the heart of what I'm trying to get at, that we need to create a culture in which it's possible to uh, explore and try new things and to get things wrong and to uh, try things out like kids do. Um, so... I want to do a really brief word association with you. Uh, I'm guessing that since the title of this lecture had entrepreneurship in it, most people in the room are fairly comfortable with the term. But I'm not going to take that for granted. I want to do a, a word association with you. So um, just, just take a note in your, in your mind, in your heart, of what comes to mind as soon as I say the following words. And the first one is artist. Next we have Explorer. And then Minister. And then Collaborator. Entrepreneur. Curator. And lastly, investor. Now, there's too many people in this room and not enough time to say what did you what were your responses. I've done that exercise lots of times and you roughly get the same kinds of responses. Um, and uh, the, the point of doing that is to say uh, all of those words and their associations what the positive parts of their associations are, I think are caught up in this word, entrepreneur. So people are thinking, why, why do you use that word entrepreneur? It's so loaded with baggage, it's really unhelpful, because it just makes us think of business culture. And actually, that's, that's really not what we're trying to do in the church. Although some in the church would say that's exactly what we want to do, because actually we've got no money left. But, <laughs> but, that, but that's not the point. Um, people, people are uncomfortable with it, which is interesting, because they're comfortable with other language drawn from business and commerce. But this word is, has some uncomfortable baggage for some people. But I would say it's really important that we use this word and not pioneer or creative person because entrepreneur catches up a whole range of qualities that other words just don't. And actually using that word is important because then we can say we're talking about that kind of person, someone who is creative, but is also innovative, is also able to take risks, actually is also to take others with them. The, the stereotype of entrepreneur comes from the 1980s enterprise culture where you had get rich quick, uh, you know, people who at others' expense make a load of money, buy the nice house and the nice car, and who cares what happens to everyone else. That's the stereotype, but that actually is not where we see most entrepreneurs operating. Most successful entrepreneurs know they have to take others with them. Uh, it's about a group effort, trust is essential. Most entrepreneurs are not in it for the money. Uh, they do it because there's a personal drive, a desire to uh, have a, a challenge, a personal challenge. And most entrepreneurs are habitual. They'll do project after project after project. And the work of many entrepreneurs outside the finance sector uh, benefits a great number of other people. So this is a really helpful word for us. And we need to shake off, I think, the church, this ridiculous idea of the sort of 1980s Ferrari driving enterprise culture sort of lone ranger, which really was never true but it's become this sort of thing in people's minds. <coughs> However, uh, some of you may know Chris Housen. Um, he's written some stuff uh, around justice in the church. Uh, I've worked with him up in the Northeast. He's a chaplain at Sunderland uh, University. When I interviewed a whole range of people about it, and I said, what's your reaction to the word entrepreneur? He said that. And he, ex he, he unpacked it at some length, actually. Um, uh, but he, so he loathed the use of the term entrepreneur. David Wilkinson, on the other hand, who was my boss up in Durham, uh, 
principal of St John's College. So I love that term. It's very helpful to me. I like people who take risks. And uh, as the principal of St John's College, he was highly entrepreneurial. But his brand of entrepreneurship drew others in. <coughs> he would say to others, if you have ideas, come and see me, let's make it happen. I interviewed Justin Welby um, when he was Bishop of Durham for a year. Um, and, and in fact, he, he was obviously busy being a person and uh, had me around for a breakfast meeting and, uh, about seven in the morning, dark in the middle of winter, and uh, I got lost on the way and uh, eventually found his house and opened the door. He was there on his own. And uh, I, since I was two, it was just dark times, and since I was two, couldn't, can't bear party. I, just didn't, I don't know what, what happened to me when I was a baby, but, um, and uh, so I, I just never, he opened the door and said, oh, hi, Michael, glad you've made it, uh, do sit down, we're having breakfast. Porridge okay? <laughs> and uh, there was two bowls set out, and I had that moment of thinking, do I tell the bishop that I just can't stand the smell of porridge? Uh, I said, that's part of fine porridge, it's fine. <laughs> I ate some porridge, and I've eaten it ever since. I had it. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Justin. Um, I won't read that out, you can read it for yourself. Uh, Justin is, as, as is, and that's not a surprise, right? I mean, Justin w was involved in the oil industry, and we know he has entrepreneurial characteristics. That's obvious in the way he, he does things, he goes about things, and he's a mission giver. And when I said to him, you know, uh, Bishop, some, some uh, clergy will say, I don't have time to be entrepreneurial. He said, um, and I haven't quoted him on this, but he said, that's nonsense. Actually, no one's looking over your shoulder when you were in Paris. You, you, can, you can make space to do things. If you're entrepreneurial, you will act entrepreneurial. You will organise your time so that that's what you're doing. Uh, and, and so don't, that's, that's just an excuse, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, but he's, he would say this is an important thing. He did say. Uh, this is the kind of core of my own thesis. And I said this right at the start of my uh, lecture. I want to encourage us to adopt this, to, to recognise the importance of entrepreneurship and to work towards the wider church, seeing that this is an important gift of God and making space for it. What it's really important to say, and I'll come back to this, is we don't all have to be entrepreneurs. So I've, I've, I learned this lesson quite early on in my research and talking about this. So people would listen to me and say, man, you seem really excited about this, and I can see how this is a really important thing for the church. But I'm not entrepreneurial, and I feel slightly diminished by your onslaught and your insistence that we should all be entrepreneurial. So I learned to say, actually, that's not what I'm saying. Of course, we're all wired differently. But the, but the church, in recent decades, has not encouraged entrepreneurial approaches to mission and ministry, because the ship's been running quite happily along. Entrepreneurs are annoying people. You know, they see things differently and want to do different things. And in stable times, there's not much need, there's not much call for entrepreneurship, because things are all going along fine. In discontinuous, unstable times, there is a need for people who can act creatively, and I'd say we're in those times now. Um, and one of the people I interviewed, the parish priest up in the northeast, um, and said, boy, am I a serial entrepreneur. You know, I was in business before I ran two companies before I came into the Church of England. Um, and he said, but I really learned pretty early on in the selection process to stop talking about entrepreneurship because it made people uncomfortable. <coughs> they said, I learned a lingo, a jargon, a way of talking that was more about spirituality and stability and so on. Which he said are kind of true, various parts of who I am, but actually the key part of who I am, the kind of driven, habitual, looking for new, I just played it right down because I thought I'm not going to get through this selection process. Mm -hmm. That was, the, and that's quoted in the book. That's, for me, that was a real red light moment or green light moment or something, you know, a kind of warning light moment of thinking that's what we need to address. The, the, and that's a whole culture change because that's about all those involved in the selection process and the training process and the deployment process and the, you know, so on and so on. Because actually we want to create a culture where people can say, this is who I am, and the church says, brilliant, we really welcome that. And not just to say, if you're sort of entrepreneurial, you get the tag pioneer minister mm. and, we, and you go off over there because we don't know what to do with you. <laughs> so yeah. but that, that's... That is doing stuff at a distance which says, yeah, we're addressing it, but the heart of the institution doesn't need to change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's my piece. Uh, why do we need to do this? Um, two quotes here. Um, entrepreneurs, this is from Bill Bolton. You may be familiar with Bill Bolton's work. Bill Bolton and John Thompson uh, published this book, Entrepreneurs, Talent, Temperament, Technique. It's kind of go-to book in the area of entrepreneurship. Bill Bolton's also a lay reader in Chelmsford's diocese. 
It gave me quite a bit of time after my research. Um, they say this, entrepreneurs create and build the future. They're in every walk of life, in every group of people, every community group, every public organisation has within it an entrepreneurial potential. So actually we see entrepreneurs in schools, in hospitals, in a whole range of um, you know, small time contexts because they're people who see the opportunities and draw others together and get things done. And that's valuable in any context. And that's from uh, your book um, that, that's at the back there. Um, they're a gift of God to the church. I've said this stuff, so I won't read it out. Well, just to emphasise this, I don't think entrepreneurs just spot things you know, that are going to suit them or are exciting to them. I think in the context in which we're talking about it here, entrepreneurs in the church, uh, this is really important. They recognise opportunities offered by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God uh, is moving, uh, hovering over the church, uh, working within the church, presenting opportunities to the church. Entrepreneurs are often the ones who spot that and say, look what, the, what God might be doing. Or are able to help us see and discern as a group. So we need a definition. Actually, you know, if you start to get into research on anything, you've got to find definitions. You realise there is no definition for the entrepreneur. There are hundreds of definitions in the literature. Um, so I, I, I haven't presented my own one. I've written my own. Um, and when I showed it to Bill Bob, he said, what do, you, what, what do you write a definition for? We've written a definition. <laughs> well, what's wrong with our definition? I said, well, I wanted to have one too, so I could write my own definition. <laughs> he said, but your, 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 your one isn't as good as mine. Just use mine. So anyway, I'm using Bill's here. <laughs> uh, so I'll let you just read that for a moment. Now, if I just say a couple of things about it. So a person can be an individual or a group of people. Entrepreneurs can be, can be groups too. Habitual is key, because entrepreneurs don't just do something once. That you, you will notice something, you, you may be entrepreneurial. If you are, you'll notice it in yourself. And if you're not, you'll notice it in those that you think, ah, oh, yeah, they're, they're definitely entrepreneur, entrepreneurial. There's a kind of consistent, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this next, and I'm doing this next. Successful entrepreneurs see those things through. Um, the kind of entrepreneurship I'd want to steer away from is the kind of 10 new ideas before breakfast, let's just get things going. That hurts people in the end and damages people. And it's important to flag that because um, certainly that came up in my research when I was interviewing parish um, clergy and then people in senior staff as well, archdeacons and so on, would say, I'm nervous of entrepreneurs because if they do a bunch of stuff in a parish church that then you know, just leaves people hanging and they move on, that's really dangerous, and someone else then has to go and pick up all the pieces, and we've got a big problem to deal with. So I would say successful, fruitful entrepreneurs, well, that's probably a better word, fruitful entrepreneurs, work with people and see things through. They build something of recognised value. To do that, you have to see it through, and so that others can say, I can see, I can see the value for this community or for this group of people. Uh, so they're habitual, but they don't just, it's not because that they you know, um, they're, they're trying to um, satisfy their own needs, it's just how they are. <coughs> uh, creating and innovating. Creating is an interesting thing to talk about, because some people say, oh, well, I'm not really creative. When Bill Bolton and John Thompson use that word, they're not talking about um, artistic creativity or musical creativity, they're talking about the ability to spot opportunities or to spot connections. So to say, oh, we do that over there like that, and we do this like this. If we brought those two things together, I reckon we could do that in a different way. It's that kind of creativity, the ability to <coughs> spot odd connections and bring things together. Um, so that's the definition I'll be using. And as you can see, there's nothing in that that um, points exclusively to finance or business. That definition allows us to talk about people in a whole range of different contexts, not just in industry, business, finance. And uh, just a little list of, uh, of things that I identified in the people I spoke to who were acting entrepreneurially. Um, we did a bunch of tests, we did an online test, just to see, test their entrepreneurial uh, ability. And these are the kinds of things we see. And again, I, I would just encourage you to think about this in relation to yourself or those that you work with or know. Um, 
Entrepreneurs generally have vision or able to um, have vision or, or articulate the vision of a group and say, I think this is where we're going, right? And, and hold something up in front of others. They, there's creativity at play, the kind of creativity I've just talked about rather than uh, artistic creativity. They have an ability to communicate. After all, if you have a vision and you can't communicate it to anyone, it's not, nothing's going to happen with it. So there has to be an ability to communicate somehow uh, effectively and to collaborate. Entrepreneurs can't do anything much on their own. It'd be pretty ineffective if they just work alone. Uh, this is key. This came up again and again in my research. Uh, what's important in your congregation in terms of taking people forward? Trust. Once you've blown trust, no one's going to come with you. you know? And that's when you start, you know, the damage starts to kick in because you'll get the entrepreneur steaming along on their own with their vision, having not built any trust. No one's come with them and you, know, you get a goal. Can I just ask, are you going yeah. to send these out to them anywhere, or can you have a copy of I can do that, I can send we them to you. Yeah. If, if you're okay, we could put them on yeah. the website, so, so, and, yeah. and then put, For a put small them in the house to be Yeah, I can send them and they can be sent out, absolutely. Yeah. Um, th this again is key, if you have struggled to make decisions, you're not going to make a great entrepreneur. Procrastination isn't something that most entrepreneurs have much time with, or truck with. Because actually, uh, so it's not, so wisdom is required, judgment in decision making, and that comes from experience. Um, you need to be someone who can make decisions uh, and live with the consequences, actually. So if those things go wrong, okay, well, we tried our best, we lined things up, we tried to be wise, it's gone wrong, let's learn from that, let's move on, let's admit our mistakes. And when I interviewed David Wilkinson, that was a key thing he said entrepreneurs will make mistakes, the key thing is admitting them publicly learning from them and moving on. And he used an interesting phrase. David Wilkinson um, had said when he was younger, um, he was mentored towards opportunity. And I love that. So he said, when I was about 16, two older guys, scientists in his church, uh, he said, mentored me towards opportunity. I didn't realize it at the time. They put time into me. They spent a lot of time with me. They created opportunities for me to take. They never said to me, it would be all right if you fail. They always made me think that I wouldn't. You know, but when I did, they encouraged me to own that and to move on. So, judgment is energy is key, and we found that in the East Durham Mission Project, energy was at a low ebb. When you've got congregations of eight people, or twelve people trying to keep a building open, doing all the jobs, and quite frankly, you know, tired out, um, energy isn't a commodity you've got a lot of, and and. The, but because God works in the barren place, the small place, the place where that's apparently <coughs> not up to much, an injection of energy from outside can really help and stimulate uh, and, and bring the shoots of new growth. So energy is key, and I think it's one of the best gifts that entrepreneurs can give uh, in a local context of bringing energy, enthusiasm, and that's infectious. Uh, commitment to sort of see something through and then create value. So these are the kinds of things that we see entrepreneurs doing. I wonder with some of what you said, to, to add to that, that you know, tenacity and the willingness to bear pain yeah. are, are, are a key other ingredient. Yeah, I would, yeah. tenacity but not pig-headedness. You know, yeah, so tenacity with humility. Yeah, seeing stuff through, being able to yeah, bear pain would be, that's good, yeah, yeah. My, my, so I want to encourage much more lay entrepreneurship with clergy or ministers or authorised people, whether creating space for their people to act entrepreneurially, rather than ministers hearing this and going, I need to be an entrepreneur and be tenacious, because I think that can end up with the minister's big grand vision um, more often than not, or the bishop's big grand vision, or the archdeacon's local vision, or the rural dean's big grand vision, and that actually just disables the people of God. Um, you know, that top-down CEO mentality, I've come in, I'm, I'm, I've been asked to come in as the leader, so it's my job to have a vision and to tell you what it is and communicate that well. I, that, 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 that takes away from what the people of God can potentially do and creates um, passivity, which is of little use to anyone. And actually, I think we need to know that God's new future has to emerge from the people of God and that the role, therefore, of leadership is to enable that to happen and to get out of the way. Um, and to create an environment in which the people of God can grow in confidence and faith and hope and trust and begin to try new things around the edge and see new shoots growing. So, yeah.
So back to the first the, the question at the beginning of the lecture, is, on, is entrepreneurship relevant to rural church leadership? Um, and as I was thinking this through, I thought actually there's a kind of, there's a bunch of what academics do isn't start pulling apart every single word. And I'll save you the pain. I took out about 20 slides, but for me working it all through, save you that pain. Basically, um, it's really important to say what do we mean by rural? And you know, we could have that conversation for the next week. Like, you know, what's what's rural? I mean, roughly contexts that are not urban. You know, so <laughs> just, just, just to condense a whole load of reports on the internet and a, and a load of literature. So rural could be the village just along from me in Cambridge, which is a dormitory for Cambridge, but has countryside, all, you know, has fields all around it, and has some farmers. But most, you know, rural could be isolated Northumberland, where I was frequently in my past the last job. You know, where you've got farms that are miles from anywhere, or uh, a market town like Hexham, where I spend a lot of time. My parents live there, which is very rural, but it's a town. So, I mean, you guys know much more about this than me, but I think we're talking about a diverse range of contexts, you know, which could include dormitory sleeper villages or isolated little hamlets, you know, and everything in between. And when we say rural church leadership, I just think it, I've just made the point before, it's key to say this is lay leadership and ordained leadership. So we're putting the lay bit first. This is lay leadership and ordained leadership. If there's a place for the ordained ministry of whatever denomination, of course there is. But I think we're, and, and you maybe have a sense of this too, moving towards a time where actually the, 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 the people of God need to be released into the kinds of leadership that, 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 that they are able to demonstrate and, and to not. And that, that, when I went to East Durham to work with those nine parishes, you, you suddenly realise, oh, we've got a great gift here. Because these people have had faithful priests in the past who were... Um, often fairly dominant figures in those communities and did everything. And the people did not very much in terms of their worshiping life and so on. And, and the priests did everything. We'd stay for 30 years. Um, now, they've all gone. But I mean, we've got a sort of a culture of passivity left behind with people thinking, well, it needs to be, if it's going to be real authentic ministry, it needs to be a collar. You know? So trying to get pastoral groups to go and do funeral visits and so on is tricky because the person you're visiting doesn't want you, they want the vicar you know, and all of that. So that. That's another part of culture that has to change. However, we've got a moment of opportunity, we genuinely have, because those, the vicars have, all, have gone. So, you know, if the church is going to stay there and we trust God builds his church, you know, if you've got one vicar in five parishes or six or ten parishes, what a great moment of opportunity. Obviously, I can see the glass half empty bit as well. But a great moment of opportunity for people to step forward and take, take stuff on and start to say, all right, Lord, what's my role here? Um, I was going to make another point there, but it's completely gone from my mind. <laughs> okay. When you're at rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go. That was the point. So you can start saying to people when you stand up in the pulpit to do your, you know, your sermon in front of eight people, guys, look, unless God does something here, we're stuck, aren't we? You know, so actually, that's, that's a good place to be because we can get on our knees and say, Lord, have mercy upon us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You know, that's a that's a good place to be. I would rather be deployed. So I guess these were markers for these rural ministers of, look, that's roughly where I'm trying to get to. So all the things I'm doing are trying to get me to that, or get the church to that point. <coughs> so, and that's helpful, because then you think, okay, you know, yeah, that's some kind of direction. Obviously, the, the, the main aim, right, um, the main aim um, is, is, has something to do with the fact that we are sent people. Um, that, so I teach mission, so mission lecture number one, God is a God of sending love. God is the God who invites us to participate in his nature, to participate in the, in, in the heart of his life. So if God is a sending God, if we participate in the life and the heart of God, then we become a sent people. So to become a Christian is to join the people of God, we participate in the life of God, and God sends Son and then sends the Spirit into the world. And, the, and God's mission is to bring all things under the Lordship of Christ. That's God's mission, to bring the whole created order under the Lordship of Christ. So the church is called to, to participate in that. So rural church ministry has something to do with that, because that's the, that, that's the kind of meta story of the wider church. The whole church is called to participate with God in his mission, of bringing everything under the Lordship of Christ. The rural church has a part to play in that. So rural church leaders help people in rural contexts to participate in God's mission. What does God's mission look like? 
well then we go back to these slides. When God's, when the kingdom is coming, it looks something like this. And you'd want to throw in there, I guess, yes, the community's flourishing, yeah, people are known, yes, people have a stake and they feel uh, able to contribute. People are coming to know Jesus Christ and having their lives transformed, and that's going to look a certain way in a rural community, and it's going to be about others, other flourishing there. But that's, those, that set of slides is sort of my attempt, really, to think, what are we doing in rural context? Well, it has a particular shape, but it's the same thing we're doing in every context. The church is called into the world to share, share the gospel and to see communities transformed. Um, I've, I've mentioned this already. Entrepreneurship is a gift. It's really important to see it that way, not an imposition or an unfortunate problem. Um, when I was talking to Jerry just before, we, we, you know, he shared with me that a prominent author, a prominent writer, speaker, publisher, broadcaster, had, 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 had said recently in the Church Times, uh, or had made some disparaging comments about entrepreneurship, you know, that, that, that that's not really the kind of thing we want in the church. And I don't say, that's ridiculous. This is a gift of God, but it's one gift among others. There's a range of gifts for the flourishing of the people of God. This is one of them. And it's important that we see it as such and accept it as such. <coughs> I've made that point already. Well, this, was in, this was interesting, actually, because this is one of the churches I was working with in East Durham. In fact, that one was closed. But it was one of three that came in a little um, benefit. And... Uh, so there was no vicar. They just appointed someone just recently, actually. But, so I was working in the, in the other two that were open, and they were being run by the church wardens who were highly entrepreneurial. They <coughs> couldn't wait for the vicar to arrive and give over all the things they'd been doing. <laughs> but I thought that was a great shame, because they had real energy. They had the trust of everyone in the church and in the wider community. They'd lived there for all their lives, so they knew exactly what was going on in the community, would be able to, you know, when I say, what about this? They go, no, Michael, that won't work because of these reasons, but Interesting you should say that, because we think we should try this. It's brilliant. I remember chairing a PCC meeting where a woman in her 90s said, um, I won't do the voice, but <laughs> said, <laughs> said um, we, Michael, what do you think? We want to get Wi-Fi in the church so that we can clear this back bit and have a cafe, because the, sh the church was opposite the um, a, a place where a toddler group was held. And then the mums could come out, and they could come in here. And, you know, these guys had come up with that on their own, which isn't, you know, rocket science, but it was amazing to hear someone in their 90s say, what do you reckon if we, it would, and someone else went, oh, we need a faculty. <laughs> <laughs> we should just do it. <laughs> um, this isn't very clear, the, the writing on the driveway there, there's a driveway, it's my son, one of my sons, when we understand this, when we understand this, we can create environments in which entrepreneurs can emerge. It really, this, this photo I managed to snap really quickly. That's my son Tom about a year ago when he was seven. Now, that's our driveway up in Durham, right? And there was a, there was a, if you know Durham at all, this is the crossroads where the university library is. The university library is there, and there's a pub on this corner, and our house is on this corner. So there's some traffic lights here. Tom had thought to himself, without telling any of us, I'm going to sell some stuff to the cars who are queuing up at the traffic <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, Without it, so we're doing something else inside the house. I came out, and Tom had been out there for almost an hour. Like, not remiss of me, because uh, but Tom's always off doing other things. But, um, and he knows where the boundaries are, and you can see he's inside the boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Tom had um, decided to set these, the tables up and sell little booklets that he'd made to the cars, and then he kind of ramped it up to selling water and some various other things. So we, we were like, just what? How ridiculous, he's not going to make any, who's going to give him any money? He made eight pounds. So his brother was like, oh my goodness. I want to do it too. Uh, but the point, I mean, Tom has a, an entrepreneurial character. <coughs> but we could have suppressed that quite early on. Now, I'm not, this isn't a model, I'm not the model parent. But we try, I guess, to create an environment in which the kids can try stuff. Not that, in that annoying way, where we're always going, do this, do it. We don't do that. But they kind of get on with stuff, and we, we, we go, great, that's great. Don't make a big thing of it. So out of that, Tom said, so we have to create environments in which that can happen. So you can't make it happen, but you can certainly create an environment in which it could happen. 
and you really can shut it down. So that's something you absolutely don't want to do. You know, get out of the way. This is the back garden, Reuben and Tom. Um, this was a couple of years ago. We were building a veggie box, uh, where I was, and then they wanted to help. And if you've had anything to do with kids, you'll know that's more of a hindrance than a help. But again, you say, all right, because the point isn't that I have a perfect vegetable box here. The point is, because we've done it so they can see vegetables grow. The point is they get to see how one gets made. They get to join in. They need to be part of this. I had to create a permission giving environment, if you like. You can see Ruben, it's not very clear. Ruben's got a fork and it's just about an inch away from his foot. <laughs> so obviously I'm monitoring that, but I'm like, of course you can use the fork. <laughs> of course you can use the spade to see what that's like, to see what it feels like, to have a go, to try it out, you know, and then to see stuff grow and be able to go, I helped dad build that. You get the point, you know, to be able to create environments where people can try stuff out, even if it's a bit messy and looks a bit dangerous and a bit risky. And I'm not quite sure how it's going to turn out, and I can't really monitor the results, and so on. But to create the kind of environment where that is possible. This was uh, one of the quotes from my little focus group just recently. This guy said, uh, the vicar, permission giving is very important. People think the church will have a reason to say no. My default is to say yes and give permission. So I think this comes into, he's talking about people in the wider community. But I think actually there would be people within the church too who may not approach clergy because they say, well, it won't happen. Uh, and the most permission-giving <coughs> priest I met uh, was, um, oh, shoot, right. I mean, you uh, cover up people's identities, don't you? I've got to have to be careful. Uh, uh, she was uh, running a, um, a sort of minster-type church in a, in a market town. Um, and... Um, she, when I asked her to explain what she did, she just said, I basically get, the, get as many people in the church as often as I can. So I just say to everyone, you can use the church for your function. So she, we have a beer festival in there. We have the flower festival. We have this, this, and this. I got myself on these um, parts of the county council so I can, as soon as someone says, we haven't got a venue, I go, well, we have, and then we can use the church. So and she said, and I got all my people trained up in catering, you know, different certificates. So because when they say we need a catering, so she says, well, we'll do that. And uh, we've, we've got all the people trained right up and we've had a catering type kitchen put into the church, so we then get the revenue for that as well. And she said, now everyone in the town has been in that church umpteen times and is completely familiar with it, so when I do their funeral, you know, you get the kind of thing. But it's that permission giving, she, she said, I'm not just say yes, but go and find places where I can say yes, places where I can offer this building. Now that's a little town, and that's different to a little rural community, obviously. But the point stays, permission giving is very important, being able to give permission where possible. But I did think of this. So this picture is of an open gate into a field just to represent the idea that you are in the gate. But then you always get people, people who might be standing here going, I can see the gate's open, I'm a bit frightened to go through. <laughs> I don't know what to do. People say, it's all very well mind to talk about permission giving, but my people haven't got any energy, so there's no one to give permission to. They don't want permission. Actually, they just want me to do everything, and I'm exhausted. Um, and that may be true, and I experienced that in some of the villages in East Durham I was working with. But people will follow you through the gate. So it's not just enough to just go, do what you like, guys, do what you like. Because people are often, you can't, can't imagine anything other than what has been. So if you were to say, let's think about new ways of doing things, they'll go, well, is it some version of what we've done before? Because I don't know any other ways. So there's uh, a way in which, I guess, ordained leadership can perhaps bring some ideas to the table and say, well, perhaps we could do this and this and this, and along the way I'm going to nurture you into it. And then before long, people have seen examples, and perhaps then the permission giving begins to bear fruit. So you may have to lead people through the gate and not just open the gate. Absolutely. <coughs> Coming into land, there's not wrestlers yet. <laughs> uh, I think entrepreneurs, as we release them, as they have permission to do things, will do will will quite naturally do the following things. There are eleven things. Let me show you. I think um, as permission is given, these will be the things that we see. Um, and actually, whether or not you're an entrepreneur, most of these things you could do. You could practice these things, and by doing these, set an example so that the entrepreneurs, the, the latent hidden entrepreneurs in, in your midst or within your sphere of influence, would see and look on and go, I could do. So here are the, the things. 
first of all, be around. It just sounds like obvious, but actually it's not. When the Dean Durham project, being present as often as possible to people was key. Because by being around, you build trust and you build relationships. And then people start to go, I might, I might be with you, Dean, because you're, you're in this with us. So being present. It's a really important thing as the Church of England develops um, new modes of training. The default is because it's, 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 it's cheaper and it's, it's an unexamined assumption at the moment. Internet based stuff. Mm-hmm. Internet based stuff when you live in a rural community is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, you don't see many people, so it's actually quite nice to go and be with people. <laughs> Secondly, you may have a really poor internet connection, so you can't, you, you know, it's really. So actually resourcing those who can go and be around. And even if it's for two people or three people, because if you spend enough time with those two or three people, they're going to catch some vision and, ca- and, and be energised and feel they matter. And then those two or three people can go and do other stuff with that, another two or three people. But being present, not being remote, and it worries me because I'm part of the conversations in theological education about remote delivery of training, which just is the default go-to in lots of committee meetings. And you want to go, that's a problem, guys. It really is. Um, this is what I saw in the, ch- in the two church wardens I talked about who were running the church where the older lady said, let's have Wi-Fi. They were passionate, they were engaged, they were informed. They knew their communities, they were rooted in those communities, they had a passion for those communities. So I think entrepreneurs bring these things. It's not that other people don't, but entrepreneurs tend to be um, the people who go, oh, you're pretty passionate about that. Um, and, and you see, the thing is about spotting new ideas, it can only come out of being engaged and informed. Because you'll say, I know we do this, and I know we do that, and I know why we do it, and now we're going to do this instead. So the engagedness allows an informed creativity, so that new things can happen. They bring energy. Um, <coughs> that's a standard answer to say no. And when energy is at a low ebb, that's, that's key too. They have people's trust. Um, and as people trust, they'll go together. Um, and begin to try things that perhaps they would not have done um, you know, a year before. They generate hope and joy. I think you know, in communities, again, think about East Durham because that's my most recent experience, um, hope and joy were in short supply. So as there's presence and as there's <coughs> attention and as trust builds, it seems that hope and joy follow along. Uh, actually, that's part of the fruit of God's presence, right? The fruit of the Spirit uh, comes. And the, 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 the work of the Spirit is in his life. We, one begins to see hope and joy because new possibilities seem uh, to be emerging. This, these are in no particular order. If I was going to put them in an order, I'd put this one at the front. Mm-hmm. Because I think in the, in the entrepreneurs in rural church settings, uh, in any church setting, need to be praying, 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 and making prayer the main, the heart of their work. And we realised this in East Durham, we thought actually, this, we do need a miracle here. In fact, I'd spoken to someone quite prominent in the diocese when I said we're going to do this East Durham Mission Project, and, and this person actually said to me, oh goodness, why are they sending you there? There's no hope there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which I, 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 I was like, ah... Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> but it became apparent to me that that was exactly where you should be working, therefore, if there's no hope or no human hope, because then you can say, I made the point already, Lord, I am on my knees. We are on our knees. Please do something here. And we're not going to tell you what it should be, but please do something here. You know, and it will, it will be what you want. And I genuinely believe God honours that prayer. Because I think if people in, a, you know, in, in an eight-person rural parish that is to get on their knees and say, Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't know how it's been, and you know our fears. What do you want? What are you doing here in this community? Because God, sure enough, is doing something. You know, I, I say that to my students at Ridley. God's always doing a new thing. That's the nature of God. Right? God is always and everywhere doing a new thing. So God is sure enough doing something where you live, but this is how to move into the heart of that and allow God's heart to shape those prayers. Uh, entrepreneurs have and share vision that emerges out of the praying, I think. Uh, they draw people together around shared concerns. 
to see projects through to completion, that point's already been made. They don't run off halfway through, mm -hmm. although I have done that before, so I have to own my own shame. Mm -hmm. um, but you learn from that, you don't do it again. Uh, they're comfortable with change, but maybe more importantly, they help others to transition through change well. It's too difficult for a lot of people. I was reading in John's Gospel where Jesus said, I have many more things to tell you, more than you can now bear. Um, that's, that, there's a truth there for all of us, actually. None of us like change. It's, a, it's an odd individual who enjoys change because we're always trying to orientate ourselves in the world and say, what, you know, what does I feel secure? And that's just being human. So we shouldn't berate people if we're highly entrepreneurial for not enjoying change and to say to them, change is just part of life, come on, we're changing. Because they'll fight you. Because part of their identity, we know this, but part of their identity is tied up in how it's been. So if you say we're going to change, then part of their identity is going with it. So there has to be deep, wise, prayerful, informed help in the transition. And, and, and people need to be uh, navigating change at the pace they can manage. And I'd suggest that the church or the local archdeacon or whoever it is um, is impatient. Which, sorry, apologies if there's any archdeacons. Yeah. <laughs> Great respect for archdeacons. <laughs> actually, a brilliant archdeacon up in Durham, actually. Um, Ian was fantastic. Very, so, you know, dig, dig myself into a hole. <laughs> Not talk so much about change, although that can be on the agenda, but help people navigate the change. So talk about how we transition into change. Because change is... That's happening, right? So how do we how do we help people do it? Uh, entrepreneurs start where they are with what they have, and this is something to do with sort of not saying to God, "It's got to look like this." You know, I've noticed that when I the focus group comments didn't say fruitfulness looks like a booming church. It looks like fifty people in here every Sunday or hundred people. Fruitfulness doesn't look like that in rural church leadership. Fruitfulness is about the whole community flourishing and people being known and contributing. So. Um, the eight people may continue to be the eight people in the congregation and that's okay because that's the eight praying people in that community who are committed to that you know, and that's great but, so we start there and we start with what we've got which is the eight praying people and we say Lord what do you want to do here and it may be that God's doing something that's entirely surprising and being open enough and holding our hands flat enough to say Lord do what you want to do here and use us in the process uh, without saying, well, it's got to look like this before this. So we expect <coughs> that it would look like this. I think this is the last one. That, this is related. Entrepreneurs in this kind of context will be excited about small. Small is beautiful. Small is, is good. God is in the small. He doesn't need to be big. I'll try to say that in a number of other ways. <laughs> small is good and precious. And I remember sitting on my first Sunday in one of the churches I was working in in East Durham, uh, I sat down behind the lectern, and one, someone came up to read the Old Testament, and then they sang a psalm, gospel around the church, and then the gospel. And I remember being almost moved to tears, but looking just around at the people and thinking, you know what, this would, be, this would, this would look pretty stupid to most people like that you know, I know. Just to look at them, what are we doing? You know, here I am in my cap and gown, and everyone's got his bow, and it's a bit funny, and we're all here far too early in the morning, and, and so on. Uh, I have a deep sense of how nonsensical that might look to some people and how precious it was to God that we had all bothered to turn up and give our time to God that morning and that God would say, you know what, Mike, you want to find where I am, come among the poor, I mean that in the broadest possible sense, and, and the have-nots and, and, the, and the, the funny thing on the edge. That's where I am. I'm here. You know, this is where I am at work. Um, and that was helpful to me as I spent time with those people. And they were great people, but to, to thinking, this is what are we doing? Is this? Do we want more of this? Is this the future? Um, and and just being able to say to, to offer that to God and for God to go, yeah, you don't need to know what the future is. You just need to be faithfully turning up here, and we'll see what happens next. You know. So in this in summary, last slide. In some entrepreneurs are a gift of God to the church. Really important to know that not all people are entrepreneurs. That's fine, but we need to create a culture or an environment in which they can emerge. That involves giving permission, <coughs> encouraging experimentation. Uh, we need to learn to recognise the entrepreneurs in our midst. We start where we are with what we've got, and we'll expect them to be full of faith and hope, because this is God's work, and not ours. Amen. Amen.